are continuing and actually finishing up in our series entitled Origins as we have been looking at the beginning, the, the period of Genesis that we are, are, have been studying for the last few months. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 9. Uh, we're going to finish up this morning. Next week we're going to celebrate Easter. We're going to talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then we're going to be entering into a series for the summer and uh, through the book of Ecclesiastes entitled Chasing the Wind. And uh, then in the fall we will pick back up here in Genesis chapter 10 and uh, through the fall and into the winter next year we'll unpack the, the patriarchs and the covenants and so forth and uh, look more de in depth at that section of the book of Genesis. But I want to give you a heads up about where we're going over the next few weeks. But today we are in Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Really, when we think about the flood of no that happened during Noah's day that we talked about in depth last week and the week before, we, we can see this as kind of a watershed moment. It's one of the biggest events in the book of Genesis. Really, it's one of the biggest events in the Old Testament in itself. It's, it's one of those changing moments where things are different in, in a lot of different ways following the flood. And I can think about some watershed moments in my life. You can think about some watershed moments in your life. One of the biggest watershed moments, uh, at least in our lifetime, was 9-11. Uh, things that were one way before that day are different after that day. I mean, probably the biggest example of that is how we fly on airplanes, you see, before 9-11, you could just kind of get there 35, 45 minutes ahead of time. You could just make it right through the security line. In fact, you could just walk through with your whole family. Your whole family could just walk up to the gate with you. Or when you were getting off of the plane, they could be standing there waiting to greet you right there at the gate. I mean, literally just yards from where you entered the plane. But those things changed. That's no longer possible. And now we have to get there early, and we have to go through all of the dis different security, and now there's 15 different companies providing 15 different ways that you can save 12 minutes on your wait in the security line. And, and the things are completely different. I was recently flying from London into Prague, and on the way from the United States to London, I was given, I was flying on Delta, and they gave me this little travel pack when I got to my seat. It had a little disposable toothbrush, a, you know, a little eye mask. It had a, a little tube of about one ounce of toothpaste. And just a little thing, some socks or something like that. And I didn't need any of those things at the moment, so I just took that little travel pack and I threw it in my backpack. And didn't think anything else. Spent a couple days in London. We were getting ready to go to Prague. Get to uh, uh, Gatwick Airport. We're get, going through security. And all of a sudden, my backpack flags, right? So now I've got to stand in a whole other line. Uh, good times. And they got to go through it and look through it. So they pull out this travel bag. Mind you, the airline gave me this. It hadn't even been opened. It was still, still sealed with this little thing that you had to break to open it up. I hadn't even opened it. So they pulled me out, and they're going through this, and I'd gotten flagged for a one-ounce thing of toothpaste. So they said, do you want us to test this so you can keep it, or should we just throw it away? I'm like, who would test for a one-ounce thing of toothpaste? So they just throw it away. But it was a stark reminder of the, the level of security and the, the fact that things had so drastically changed. I mean, you used to be able to just bring a, a drink or food directly onto the plane that you had made at home if you wanted. Now, sometimes I'm kind of glad that they prevented people from bringing their ham sandwich that they made from home onto the plane. Uh, but it's just different now than it was. And, and it's not that the science of flying changed after 9-11, but the purpose and the approach to it and the way that we understood, understood how we are to get on and get off planes is different. I want us to see this text this morning and to think about what I've entitled seven realities to ponder post-flood. Some of those things are the same. Some of the things that God had declared prior to the flood, he reemphasizes and says, no, these are still the same. You are to be about these things. And then there's a few other things that he says, okay, now it's a fresh start. Now violence has been wiped out across the world. Now you're to go and do these things. You're to see me through this lens and we're going to look at that this morning. So if you have your Bible, Genesis chapter 9, I invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. 
I'll begin in verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish in the sea. Into your hand that they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from every man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning of the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all, all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jebeth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah and from these people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to, be a, began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Jebeth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Debeth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died. Father, we are grateful today for your word. Father, may we be reminded of the truths of your word. May we walk in them. May we see them. May we come to a deeper understanding of who you are and how you desire a relationship with you. Father, may we ever be mindful of the sin that so easily entangles. And Father, whether we've walked with you for a few short years or many years, there is an evil one that is always desiring to take us down. Father, may we be keenly aware of his tactics and strategy. Father, give us strength to stand in the Spirit. May we walk in it so that we will not satisfy the sinful desires of our flesh. Father, I pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable unto you. For you're my rock and my redeemer. I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to move quickly through the first few of these because I want to spend time on the passage that probably most of you are wondering how we're going to talk about, which is the drunk and naked man named Noah in a tent. So we'll move through the first one so we can get to that one. The first thing I want us to see, the first reality of the post-flood time is, in, is that God's plan for mankind has not changed. His plan for mankind in the garden, when he told Adam and Eve, it was for them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. And we see this same command given to Noah in chapter 9, verse 1. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Again in verse 7. Be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. 
See, God had created man in his own image, and therefore he was sending them out to multiply, to fill the entire earth with image, the image bearers of God. See, creation is is an amazing thing. Animals are amazing. Plants are amazing. The oceans are amazing. The solar system is amazing. But the most amazing thing is man, because we and we alone are made in his image. We are image bearers of God. And so when man goes out from the garden and spreads across all of the earth, we are bearing the glory, the mark of the maker on all things. And so he tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. He then tells Noah the same with his family, his boys and their wives, be fruitful and multiply. See, God's plan for his glory spreading across the earth has not changed, and it has not changed today. We are to take his glory everywhere we go as image bearers of him. The second reality in the text that I want us to see is that man's role as the pinnacle of God's creation remains the same. Look at verse 2. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. This is telling this to Noah. You are the pinnacle of the creation. You are to reign supremely over all the animals, over all of the plants, over all else that I've created. You are to have dominion over it. You are to rule over it. Just as Adam named the animals in the garden, and just as Adam exercised authority over animals in the garden, so Noah and his family, and thus all humankind, would also do the same. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every bird of the heavens upon every thing that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are delivered every moving thing that lives shall be food for you and as i gave you the green plants i give you everything noah mankind we are to reign and rule and have dominion over all the animals and all of the plants of the field This reminds us of what God told Adam in chapter 1, verse 28, when he said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every every living thing that comes or moves on the earth. The one unique thing we see in this promise to Noah is that now they are to eat of the animals. There's some indication that perhaps prior to this moment, they were only to eat of the fruits and the vegetables and the, and the, and the things of the field. But we see that because in the Scripture, when we see Adam, what we see is God said, you may eat of any tree, of any fruit except for one. And here we see indicated that now there seems to be an indication they can now eat of any animal because he's going to give them a further set of directions in just a second about what they're not to eat in the animal. Just as there was something they were not to eat of in the tree, uh, in the garden, there is a part of the animal they are not to eat as well. Which leads us to our third reality, which is that the shedding of blood is going to have a significant role in the relationship between God and man moving forward. This is the first time we see in the Scripture where this idea or this picture of blood is talked about. Now, it's not the first time blood is shed. We know that violence was one of the reasons why God caused the flood in the first place. We saw violence in the garden or outside uh, of the Garden of Eden with Cain and Abel. We saw violence in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned and God killed animals in order to provide skins to cover the sin of Adam and Eve's nakedness. And so it's not the first time a death occurs, but it's certainly a, a more expli- uh, explain, a place where God explains more about how he's going to use death and blood specifically in the relationship between God and man moving forward. Look at verse 4. He tells them in verse 3, they may eat of anything, but in verse 4 he says, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. Just the same phrasing, the same words as you shall not eat of the tree. Now they shall not eat of the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning from every beast I will require it and from man. What is he saying? He's saying you shall not eat blood. Why? Because blood represents life. If you don't have blood, you don't have 
life. If you were to lose all your blood, you would die. You don't even have to lose all your blood. You can just lose some of your blood and die. What is it that we do when we give blood through the Red Cross? White? We're providing health and life to someone else. So there's life that comes through blood. Now there's all kind of foreshadowing and things that we can talk about when we get to Easter next week, right? Like the shedding of blood, right? Gives us life. His death provides us life. But in this context, we see that it is the blood that is indicating that something is alive. And he says, for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. So if an animal kills a man, or kills a person, there is a curse, there's a punishment, there's a reckoning that comes from that. Animals are not to do that. But man is also not to do that to other man, right? We're not to be in the taking of life. And that goes for whether or not that it's a fetus in the mother's womb or a senior adult in a nursing home that has Alzheimer's and can't remember anything. All life is valuable to God. If there is blood flowing through its veins and it is human, God has great value on it. And we are image bearers. And that senior adult who's on the last stages of life, they have great value to God because they're image bearers. And that fetus in the mother's womb bears great value to God because it is an image bearer of God. Why? Because blood is flowing through its veins. It is made in the image of God. And God values it greatly. And he says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? He gives us the reason. For God made man in his own image. When we take innocent life, we are, it is an affront against the God who made them. And he takes it seriously. Why did Cain and Abel, the situation there, require God to step in in such a powerful way? Because God values life. And blood is going to play an important role in that. We can go on if we just jump a few books ahead to the book of Leviticus and we read about the law. And the law says this in chapter 17 verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. That's foreshadowing, is it not? That he's going to give blood in order for our souls to be saved. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, No person among you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you. It's no wonder the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9 would write, Under the law almost everything is purified by blood. And without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. We'll talk about the one, especially next Sunday, who shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. The fourth reality I want us to ponder this morning post-flood is that man's interaction with God will be based on covenants. It will be based on covenants. What What is a covenant? Covenant, in its most simplest terms, is an agreement. It is where one party and another party come together and they say, you do this, I will do this. But there are also what we would call unilateral or unconditional covenants, which we would see here, where the greater party will say to the lesser party, I will do this for you. Nothing is required of you. Like, there is no requirement that God gives to Noah or mankind that says, I will not flood the land again unless you do X. Or, I will not flood the land again if you keep on doing these things. He just says, I won't do it. It it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how bad you get. It doesn't matter what sin is in the world again. I won't do it again. Unilateral. The greater party can speak that to the lesser party. Look at verse 8. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you. The birds, the livestock, every beast of the field, or every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is God's covenant with mankind. He says, and I'm going to give you a sign. 
A sign of this covenant. Now, we don't always have signs for the promises of God, but in this case, we do. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, this word in Hebrew, we often say rainbow, but there's no indication in the Hebrew that has anything to do with rain. We disassociate it with rain. It's literally the word bow, like you would draw a bow. You know, the, the part of the bow is shaped just like that and then turn it over and we see it stretch from horizon to horizon to heaven and down. And this is just a, an outward sign, a physical picture of a promise God has made so that we can be reminded of His faithfulness. He says in verse 15, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living uh, creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. Now, it's important that we go back and remember when God says he will remember, just as he remembered Noah on the ark, that he doesn't forget. This is not like God needs to put the rainbow or the bow in the sky in order to go, oh yeah, I'm going to stop the rain today because I promised. No, it's an indication of what we need, that God is moving f towards us. He doesn't need a sign. We need a sign. He doesn't need to be reminded. We need to be reminded. And so he's giving us this picture of the covenant that we will remember his promise to us. That we will see it and we'll remember Verse 17, and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. But this is just really the second of many covenants. The first covenant we saw in the Garden of Eden between God and Adam, we see this covenant. We'll see other covenants in the future. We'll see the covenant on Mount Sinai that God made with the people of Israel. We'll see a covenant that he made with David. We'll see a covenant ultimately that we'll talk about on Friday night at the Good Friday service. A new covenant in his blood. And the final covenant. There is no more covenants after the one that Jesus made for us on the cross because it is the final and perfect covenant. See, it is an agreement that all who will come to the Father will come through the Son. And when we come to the Father through the Son, we will have life and we will have it abundantly. He has purchased that covenant with His what? Blood. What did we just talk about? Blood. See, there's so many things that are happening in this chapter that are giving us just little glimpses, just little shadows, just little pictures of what's coming of what God's going to do and how He's going to do it. And covenants is one of the ways He is going to do it. Now let's spend the rest of our time on these last three. Here's number five. Sin never stops chasing us. And temptation is continually in front of us. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, that's my life, right? Sin never stops being in front of me. It never stops nipping at my heels. The temptation continues to come after me. It comes for me, and it's coming for you. It came for a man named Noah. The same Noah that we've read about for the last three chapters where it said Noah was a righteous man. Noah was an obedient man. Noah was a man who sought the Lord amidst a culture who did not. And here we find, as we get into chapter 9, the end, at the end of Noah's life, Noah is not perfect. Noah fails miserably. He did not finish the race well. He did not follow through. It does not erase what the writer of Hebrews wrote about him in Hebrews 11. It does not change his faithfulness through the years, but it is a stark reminder to you and I that we can do the right thing. We can follow the Lord for many years and still in the end make a horrible, horrible mistake of our life. Some of you have experienced that. Some of you have made that mistake early in your life and you're recovering from it. Some of us maybe haven't made that mistake yet, but it ever is in front of us. 
And if we do not guard our hearts, and we do not protect our eyes, and we do not place ourselves in, in positions where God's Spirit is working in us and through us, we too, like Noah, who's listed in the hall of faith, can in the end mess our life up royally. God will still be faithful, but we will miss a blessing of God. Look with me at verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jebeth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Now, let's pause there because Moses is wanting us to see something. Canaan is the group of people that give the Israelites more grief than anybody else. And what Moses is doing here is he's saying this group that comes from the line of Ham will be a thorn in the flesh of the Israelites for years. And he's saying it all began right here with their forefather Ham who would not do the right thing. And in fact, they did the wrong thing. He goes on in verse 19. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these people the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil. So he gets off the ark, and he's no longer a carpenter building an ark. He's now a, a, a tender of the fields. And in fact, he plants a vineyard, it says. Verse 21. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. So what happens to Noah? He has now um, become a vineyard. He's harvesting grapes. He's making wine. And guess what? One night he has too much wine. He goes to his tent. He takes off all of his clothes. And he lays exposed in his tent, laying in his own mess, in his own shame, and in his own sin. Now, this is not a message on alcohol, but it is a warning. That when you become drunk, you will almost always make decisions and choices that are ungodly. I've really never been, and I haven't been around a whole lot of people that are drunk because that's just not the places I go on Friday and Saturday night. But I have been around them enough to know that rarely, if ever, do people make godly choices when they're inebriated. Almost always, 99.9% .9 of the time, they make foolish choices. They make choices that they regret later. I never met anybody who said, I was so drunk, you won't believe how good I was. I mean, it's like, no, I did this really stupid thing. Or I, I, I did this thing that really almost cost me my life. Or it, it's just a warning here that God says, be wise, don't be foolish. We see Noah acting foolishly, and he ends up laying in his own tent naked. Foolishness. Verse 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, there's that phrase again, the father of Canaan, really laying the groundwork for the people who are going to be a thorn to the Israelites. He saw the nakedness of his father and he told his brothers outside. Two problems. He saw and he told. He saw his father in his worst moment, in his shame, in his nakedness, in his sin. And the indication from the text, and again, it doesn't give us all of the reasoning why this is such a big problem, but obviously when we read out from the text, we see that it is. So we've got to draw some kind of, of, uh, of reasoning why, is that what happens when Ham sees his father in his shame is that he doesn't care for him. He doesn't try to meet his dad at his point of need. In his dad's worst moment, he doesn't try to help. He pokes fun. He, he says to his brothers, hey, look at dad. <laughs> dad really wasted on the floor in his tent. He's so drunk. He took all his clothes off. Look at what a mess dad is. This is not honoring your father. In fact, it's not only not honoring your father, it's not honoring somebody who is an image bearer of God. To find them at their worst and not help them, but to shame them even more. And unfortunately, I have seen this in my own life, and I have seen this in the church, that instead of finding somebody at their worst moment and helping them, we just pile on. We just say, well, that was really stupid. Well, boy, what goes around comes around. And we almost glory in their mistake. 
Well, if they hadn't have been so dumb, if they hadn't have been such a, a bad person, and we just pile on to people, and what the gospel has called us to do is that when we see people who have made some tragic error in their life, who have fallen into the trap of sin, instead of trying to rescue them from it, we pile on them. We do this to people in our own church, and we do this to other believers in the kingdom. And that is not a godly response to sin. Absolutely, we call sin out. Absolutely, we flee from it. Absolutely, we walk away as fast as we can from it. But we don't leave people stuck in it. We find ways to minister to them. We find ways to serve them. We find ways to love them. We recognize that all that they've done in the past cannot be erased by one moment of poor choices. How many times have we seen somebody who made a poor choice and then we just cancel them? This is something that the culture does. It's not something that the church does. There may be a cancel culture going on in our culture, but it ought not be that way in the church. We are to be a people of grace. We are to be a people of restoration, of recovery, of helping them get back on their feet, helping them walk again with the Lord, helping them experience the grace that comes from Jesus. Because guess what? That may not be you today, but my friend, it may be you tomorrow. Well, I would, I would never do that. Oh, brother. Oh, sister. Pride cometh before the fall. You and I are absolutely capable of anything we've ever seen anybody else do. And the minute we think, I won't do that, you are putting your soul in grave danger. You better approach the Lord humbly. You better approach the Lord with, I need to walk in the Spirit. I don't want to gratify the sinful desires of the flesh. I need the work of God in my life. I need the gospel preached to me every day. I mean, why do we gather as the body of Christ? Why do we surround ourselves with godly people? So they will speak the truth into our lives. Who will notice us and call us to accountability and hold us to the standard of which God has called us to walk. See, even a herald of righteousness and a man of faith like Noah can stumble and fall into sin. It, it, it reminds me of David. The same David. The same David who would not strike down Saul, who deserved to die, who was pursuing David to kill him, who had shamed David. Even King David, who had an opportunity to, to kill Saul, would not do it. Is the same David who took a man who was loyal to him in Uriah and sent him out to the battlefield to be killed. The man who was writing the Psalms to the Lord, the praises to the Lord, is the same woman who looked down from his rooftop and took the woman named, Uriah, uh, named Bathsheba into his room. See, none of us are able to withstand, apart from the grace of God, all of the temptations that are coming towards us. We must be people who walk in integrity. We must be people who walk in godliness. But we are so capable of being just like Noah. What happened? He's Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his brothers. Sin never stops chasing us. Number six. Sin continues to be exposed, but God has prepared a covering for it. Look at verse 23. Then Shem and Jebeth took a garment. These are the two other sons. So their son Ham comes down like, come look at dad. What an idiot. He's laying on the floor of the tent, naked, drunk man. Ha, ha, ha. But here's two sons that love their father and respect their father and have found him in the worst possible place. And instead of leaving him there or mocking him there, they care for him there. Look how tender what they do is. I just find great tenderness in this. I hope I can create, teach my sons to be like this towards me in my old age. Hopefully I'll never be on the floor in a tent naked. But Lord knows, who knows what will happen to me. I just want my sons to do the right thing by me. And I want to do the right thing by others. What well, they said. Then Shem and Jabbath took a garment. They laid it on both of their shoulders. So they stood here, one here, one here, and they put a garment on their shoulders, and they walk backwards into the tents so they will not see their father's shame. They will not see him at his worst possible moment. And they gently and quietly lay back the garment over him, covering his sin. 
covering his shame from the naked eye. You see the tenderness in that moment that while the sin of their father had been exposed, they were part of covering it. You see, your sin and my sin have been exposed before the father. He has seen every single thing that you've done, every single thought that you've had, every attitude you've expressed. He's seen it and he knows it. And what did he do? He sent his son into the world to die on our behalf and to cover us with his own body, his own blood, his own sacrifice. God has lovingly saw us at our worst and prepared a covering for us. And then lastly, the curse of sin brings destruction and death, but the blessings of God bring an abundance of life. Look at verse 24. When Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be to his brother. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and, the Can- and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Jebeth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. See, Noah blessed the ones that cared for him in his worst, and he cursed the ones who had, wa- who had fallen into deeper sin as a result. And so Canaan was cursed, and Shem and uh, Jebeth were blessed. And then we see this end of Noah's life. And the flood, after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950, and he died. The same fate of Noah is the same fate of you and I. In the end, when you mix together all of the times that we obeyed the Lord and all of the times that we failed the Lord, the end is still the same. And we will die. But the question is, when we die, to whom will we belong? Will we be a man or woman of faith who belongs to the Lord Jesus? Who has had our sin covered by His blood? Or will we enter into eternal gates separated from Him in a place called hell? See, the invitation this morning is that you would place your faith and trust in Jesus the author and perfecter of your faith, the one who has provided himself as a sacrifice for your sin, the one who died in your place, the one who has covered you in your worst. And the Scripture says that we can know him when we call upon his name, when we believe in our heart that he was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, and that he is the sacrificial atonement for our sin. Do you trust him today?